case you hadn't noticed, our theme is Jesus over everything. Before we go too far, I just want to take a moment and introduce myself. Some of you might be thinking, who is this random guy on stage? Why does he have a weird floral shirt on? I don't know if I like him or not. Um, <laughs> it's all right. We're going to get to know each other this morning. My name is Sam. I am uh, the Generations Pastor here at the Orleans campus. Um, and so, pleasure to meet you. Um, but if you ever see me around, feel free to stop me, say hello. I would love to get to know you, uh, at least be able to exchange names um, and put names to some faces. It'd be absolutely fantastic. Um, so, we're going to party it up this morning and get to know each other. Um, one of my favorite things to do when I first meet somebody um, is either to share an embarrassing story or to have them share an embarrassing story because I feel like it just helps us take like a huge leap forward in our friendship. So this morning, I'm going to share with you a really embarrassing story. Um, our students love these stories because they know I make a fool out of myself all the time. Um, okay, so let me take you back. I am a younging, a very young child, okay? And I'm at Disneyland with my family. My family and I decided to go to Disneyland. And so we are now walking around this amusement park. And what do you do at Disneyland? Well, you go on roller coasters, right? That's just the way it works. Disneyland, roller coasters. Disneyland, roller coasters. Makes sense, right? Um, now, get this. I do not particularly enjoy roller coasters, okay? Um, I'm more the type of person, you know, you go to an amusement park and then I would sit in like the little teacups, you know, the ones that like <laughs> spin around, you're like, there's no like upward or downward movement, it's just you spin, how fun, you know? Um, so we're at Disneyland, we've gone through kind of like the morning of uh, different roller coasters. My brother and my sister um, both, I think, really like roller coasters. I know my sister definitely does. Um, and so she's just going on all the crazy ones, all right? She's like, Mom, I want to go on this, I want to go on this. And so we're just kind of following her around. And then all of a sudden, she points at this wooden roller coaster. It's rather large in stature. Um, and she looks at me and she's like, hey, Sam, you should go, you should come with me on this roller coaster. Um, and I'm thinking to myself, you know, uh, how about teacups? You know, <laughs> like, uh, how about we do that instead? Um, and she's like, no, we... Like, come with me, come with me, come with me. All of a sudden, I had a spurt of courage, all right? I had a moment of courage, and I was like, yeah, I'll do it, okay? I'm just tall enough to make it onto the ride. So anyways, we're going, we're waiting in line. I'm super nervous, um, but kind of excited because I've never, like, done this before, right? I've only gone on the kiddie rides and on the teacups. Um, and so we finally get to the point where we're sitting down, okay? It's a neon green seat. I can picture it right now. It's ingrained in my mind. Um, <laughs> I sit down, and then there's this orange kind of uh, safety thing that you push down until you feel kind of secure, kind of. Um, and so now I'm strapped in, and we're ready to go, okay? We're moving, we're moving, and we're going up, right? You know the little click that it makes as you move up? Yeah, is everybody with me? Everyone's tracking. Um, so we're going up and up and up. I suddenly realized... I have a fear of heights, um, and so <laughs> we are making our way uh, up this roller coaster. There's no turning back. You can't stop, because if you stop the roller coaster, like, where are you going to go, you know? Um, so we're going up and up and up, and I just remember thinking to myself, I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I'm going to die. I mean, I'm looking around for my sister. Um, being like, save me, save me, but there's nothing she can do. And she's got like this huge smile on her face, right? Because she's like, oh my gosh, this is so funny. Um, so anyways, we get to the top and it stops. And then it drops. Okay, so we are now flying through the air fairly quickly, re really quickly. Um, but let me tell you something. I don't actually remember anything from that ride um, because... All, all I was doing was I was squeezing my eyes as closed as I could possibly get them, and I was latched onto this safety thing, and my head was hitting it the whole ride down. I was like, when is this going to end? When is this going to end? So, finally get off the roller coaster, and I'm like, freedom, I'm alive. Um, and so I go find my mom. My mom, I am absolutely bawling. I'm in tears. I'm just done. My sister, on the other hand, she is just killing herself laughing. 
She, <laughs> she had so much fun. She enjoyed the roller coaster. She enjoyed the sideshow of me freaking out. Um, and so it was very interesting to me because we went on the same roller coaster, had the same experience, but the outcome of it for me was not great. But for her, it was fantastic. She was like, that was the best roller coaster ever. When it comes to life, I feel like it can sometimes be like a roller coaster. You're going through life and you're going up and up and up. And then sometimes you, it's just up and down. It's just a little bit all over the place. It's a little bit crazy. But I think just like on that roller coaster with me and my sister, you can either enjoy it or you can have a terrible time. And so for some of us, you might think, hey, it's, it's just a personality thing. You know, it, it depends on your personality. If you're really optimistic, then you'll just enjoy everything. If you're not, then you won't. Um, but this morning, I want to suggest to you that maybe it has less to do with personality and a little bit more on perspective. Um, that perhaps the way that we view life has more to do with it than our personality. Because here's the thing, I, I don't need to tell you that life is difficult. Let me show you what I mean. Um, has anyone ever been worried? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Has anyone ever felt like super weak? Yeah, anyone super overwhelmed? Super tired? Super sad? A little bit angry maybe? Yeah. Um, I don't need to remind you that life can be a little bit difficult at times. But this morning, I really want you to hear this that even though life can be difficult, Jesus is still over everything. That even though sometimes situations can cause us to worry and stress out and maybe get a little bit agitated, the reality is that Jesus is still over it. And so I want uh, to dive into a little bit of scripture. It's a story uh, found in Mark chapter 5, verses 21 to 43. And it's the story of a man who comes to Jesus and he desperately needs Jesus to do something in his life. It's an urgent situation. He doesn't have time to waste. He needs Jesus to step in and step in right away. But the way that the story unfolds might be different than you would expect. So let's read. Mark chapter 5, verse 21. When Jesus had again crossed over by boat to the other side of the lake, a large crowd gathered around him while he was by the lake. Then one of the synagogue leaders named Jairus came, and he saw Jesus. He fell at his feet. He pleaded earnestly with him. My little daughter is dying. Please come and put your hands on her so that she will be healed and live. So Jesus went with him. Okay. How many of you in this place are parents? I'm not a parent, but I can only imagine the distress that this father was in. He must have come to Jesus, and it says that he uh, pleaded earnestly with him. This, this was an urgent matter. It wasn't just, Jesus, like, if you would like to, like, maybe you could, like, drop by, you know. It, it was, Jesus, like, I need you or my daughter is going to die. It was real. It was urgent. And so Jesus says, yeah, I'll, I'll do what you're asking for. I'll, I'll come with you and I'll heal your daughter. He went with him. What's interesting to note is that this man, Jairus, he was a synagogue leader. If, if you look in the Bible, uh, oftentimes the synagogue and Jesus didn't always have the same perspective. Um, they weren't always on the same page. But how many of us can, are thankful that God doesn't um, condition his involvement in our lives based on who we are or what we deserve? But that he's willing to dive head first because he loves us. It's amazing. It's amazing. So let's keep reading. A large crowd followed and pressed around him. And a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. 
Okay, okay. So Jesus has just accepted this mission to go and heal Jairus' daughter. And um, all of a sudden, another character is introduced. This woman who has been bleeding for 12 years. She's introduced into the story. But what I love is the way that she's introduced. You see, Jesus is on a mission, but the woman who comes afterward isn't a distraction. Doesn't take away from his mission. Because you see, the word that he introduces her with is, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years. You see, if Jesus considered this woman a distraction, the word but perhaps would have been used. Jesus was on a mission, but this woman stopped him from going. But this woman needed his help. And so he had no other choice. But instead of using but, he, <laughs> there's the word and. Because you see, Jesus doesn't view you as a distraction, but he views you as an opportunity to show you his love. You are never a distraction for Jesus. Yeah, you might think that, you might see that Jesus wants to do incredible things in the city of Ottawa. He's at work all over the world, and yeah, he's the king of the whole universe, but you are never a distraction to Jesus. You are always valuable in his sight. Let's keep reading. Jesus had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors, or she had suffered a great deal under the care of many doctors and had spent all she had. Yet instead of getting better, doctors had spent, doc, <laughs> one second. Um, instead of getting better, she grew worse. When she heard about Jesus, she came up behind him in the crowd and touched his cloak because she thought, if I just touch his clothes, I will be healed. Immediately, her bleeding stopped, and she felt in her body that she was freed from her suffering. So, she touches Jesus, she reaches out to Jesus, and the moment that she touches his cloak, she's healed. Now, she took an incredible risk in doing that, but she's healed instantly. What's interesting to note about this woman is that she wouldn't have been a woman who would have been regarded highly in Jewish culture because of uh, her situation and the bleeding in, in her body. Um, she would have been seen with disdain. And so she reaches out to Jesus, touches him, and instantly she's healed. Isn't that incredible? That's absolutely incredible. But what's amazing is that she's not just healed physically. Because, yeah, she stopped bleeding, but the second part of that sentence says that she was freed from her suffering. You see, when people alienate you and push you away and have a few things to say about you, it hurts a little bit. And so imagine with me how this woman must have felt. The weight of shame on her shoulders on top of pain, physical pain. And so isn't it beautiful that Jesus heals her not only physically, but he heals her emotionally. It's a much more holistic approach that when Jesus steps into our lives and when he gets involved, he doesn't just handle what you can see. He doesn't just deal with the product of perhaps the real issue that might be inside of our hearts and inside of our lives. It's amazing. Let's keep reading. At once, Jesus realized that power had gone out from him. He turned around in the crowd and asked, who touched my clothes? You see the people crowding against you? His disciples answered, and yet you can ask, who touched me? But Jesus kept looking around to see who had done it. Then the woman, knowing what, she, what had happened to her, came and fell at his feet. Trembling with fear, told him the whole truth. He said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace and be freed from your suffering. While Jesus was still speaking, people came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue leader. Your daughter is dead. 
they said. Why bother the teacher anymore? Overhearing what they said, Jesus told him, don't be afraid, just believe. Okay. So, now, think about it from Jairus' perspective. Okay? If I was Jairus, I would be a little bit upset. You know? Because, you know, I'm coming to Jesus. I'm telling him, man, this thing is urgent. Like, it's, I need you. Yeah, I, like, come with me. And he seems like he's on board, right? He, he's walking with me to my house. Um, and then all of a sudden, he gets distracted by my perspective. And he starts helping somebody else. And then they get their miracle. And when they get their miracle, I, somebody comes and tells me, hey, your daughter is dead. Which to me means they got their miracle, but I didn't get mine. How often do we go to God and you're like, God, I need you to do this in my life. I need you to fix this problem. I need you um, to address things in my heart. I need you um, to help me to, to do what I need to do. I need you to give me the strength. I need you to give me peace. And we wrestle with it and wrestle with it and wrestle with it. And then Billy over there, he's just hanging out, having a great old time. Um, and whenever he asks for anything, he gets it. For instance, last week, Billy asked for a new car. And uh, he got it. And you think to yourself, maybe I should start asking for new cars all the time because God seems to answer those prayers. But the issue is that we spend so much time focused on what God might be doing in other people's lives that perhaps it creates a little bit of jealousy and we miss what God's doing in our own lives. We miss the fact that God is consistently at work in each of our lives and he we just don't see it. So a large crowd followed and pressed around him. Oh, sorry. I'm reading the wrong sheet. Um, he did not let anyone follow him except Peter, James, and John, the brother of James. When they came to the home of the synagogue leader, Jesus saw a commotion. With people crying and wailing loudly, he went in and said to them, Why all this commotion and wailing? The child is not dead, but asleep. But they laughed at him. After he put them all out, he took the child's father and mother and the disciples who were with him and went in where the child was. He took her by the hand and said to her, Talitha kum, which means, little girl, I say to you, get up. Immediately, the little girl stood up and began to walk around. She was 12 years old. At this, they were completely astonished. He gave, they were completely astonished. He gave strict orders orders not to let anyone know about this and told them to give her something to eat. What's incredible is that before Jesus heals, um, he makes an observation. As soon as Jesus arrives at the scene, um, he's met with crying and wailing. Because the people see evidence that this girl is dead. But then Jesus steps in without even looking at the girl, and he says, no, she's not dead, but she's just asleep. If you're a bystander, like, how can you say that? You haven't seen the evidence. Might I suggest to you that Jesus makes his, uh, God makes his promises not based on the evidence, but based on who he is? That even though the evidence might say something, Jesus knows who he is. Jesus knows that he has the power over everything. And so even though the evidence might say, yeah, this little girl is dead. He's like, no. She's alive. And then he walks into the room. He um, brings her back to life. And... It's amazing. It's this incredible moment. She's walking around, and then she gives her parents two instructions. One, don't tell anybody, and two, feed her. Right? Seems like a pretty weird instruction, you know? Like, parents, I, I feel like they would know to feed their kids, right? 
But then I got to thinking about it, um, and I was like, maybe that was intentional. Because I think that when God brings things back to life in our hearts, that he does it so that we can feed it, so that we can grow it. God doesn't bring things back to life just so that they're alive again. But he brings them back to life and he allows us to see them become vibrant. Maybe God has played streams inside of your heart and over time, perhaps they've died a little bit. Perhaps you used to think that you could do great things, but maybe you got a little bit discouraged. This morning, I believe that God wants to bring those dreams back to life. And that he doesn't just want to bring them back to life for the sake of you having them. But he wants to bring them back to life so that you can step into all it is that God has called you to. Because friends, there is a world out there that needs Jesus. There is a world out there who needs so desperately to know that Jesus loves them and cares about them. And that he actually is over everything. And so, Jesus wants to bring things in your heart and in your life back to life and make them vibrant. Here's my hope and my prayer for you this morning. Is that you would leave this place knowing that Jesus is over everything. And that you wouldn't just know it in your head, but that part of your soul would just know beyond a shadow of a doubt that no matter the situation, no matter the evidence that you may see with your eyes, no matter what other people might tell you, no matter what your own brain might tell you at times, that the reality is that Jesus is still over everything. That that has not changed from the beginning of time to now, and it's not going to change tomorrow or the day after that or the day after that. What would it look like if we lived our lives knowing that Jesus was over everything? Would we maybe take a few more risks? Would we maybe be willing to see those situations in our lives that we've accepted as permanent? Maybe we begin to see them a little bit more like their seasons instead of being permanent because we know who Jesus is and we know that he can change that? What is it for you? How can you put Jesus over everything?